Hey, what's up? This is Big Two-Hearted River, written by Ernest Hemingway. It was published in 1925. This is part one. It is a two-part uh, short story. The train went on up the track out of sight, around one of the hills of Burnt Temple. Nick sat down on the bundle of canvas and bedding the baggage man had pitched out of the door of the baggage car. There was no town, nothing but the rails and the burnt-over country. The thirteen saloons that had lined the one street of Cine had not left a trace. The foundations of the mansion hotel stuck up above the ground. The stone was chipped and split by the fire. It was all that was left of the town of Cine. Even the surface had been burned off the ground. Nick looked at the burned-over stretch of hillside, where he had expected to find the scattered houses of the town and then walked down the railroad track to the bridge over the river. The river was there. It swirled against the log spiles of the bridge. Nick looked down into the clear brown water, colored from the pebbly bottom, and watched the trout keeping themselves steady in the current with wavering fins. As he watched them, they changed their positions by quick angles, only to hold steady in the fast water again. Nick watched them a very long time. He watched them holding themselves with their noses into the current. Many trout in deep, fast-moving water, slightly distorted as he watched far down through the glassy convex surface of the pool. Its surface pushing and swelling, smooth against the resistance of the log-driven spiles of the bridge. At the bottom of the pool were the big trout. Nick did not see them at first. Then he saw them at the bottom of the pool. Big trout, looking to hold themselves on a gravel bottom in a varying mist of gravel and sand, raising in spurts by the current. Nick looked down into the pool from the bridge. It was a hot day. A kingfisher flew up the stream. It was a long time since Nick had looked into a stream and seen trout. They were very satisfactory. As the shadow of the kingfisher moved up the stream, a big trout shot upstream in a long angle, only a shadow marking the angle, then lost his shadow as he came through the surface of the water, caught the sun, and then, as he went back into the stream under the surface, his shadow seemed to float down the stream with the current, unresisting to his post under the bridge, where he tightened, facing up into the current. Nick's heart tightened as the trout moved. He felt all the old feeling. He turned and looked down the stream. It stretched away pebbly bottomed with shallow and big boulders, and a deep pool, as it curved away around the foot of the bluff. Nick walked back up the ties to where his pack lay in the cinders beside the railway track. He was happy. He adjusted the pack harness around the bundle, pulling the straps tight, slung the pack on his back, got his arms through the shoulder straps, and took some of the pull off his shoulders by leaning his forehead against the wide band of the tump line. Still, it was too heavy. It was much too heavy. He had his leather rod case in his hand, and leaning forward to keep the weight of the pack high on his shoulders, he walked along the road that smoked. Long out over the country, he did not need to get his map out. He knew where he was from the position of the river. As he smoked, his legs stretched out in front of him, he noticed a grasshopper walk along the ground and go onto his woolen sock. The grasshopper was black. As he had walked along the road, climbing, he had started many grasshoppers from the dust, and they were all black too. They were not the big grasshoppers with yellow and black or red and black wings, whirring out from their black wing sheathing as they fly up. Those were just ordinary hoppers. 
but all a sooty black in color. Nick had wondered about them as he walked, without really thinking about them. Now, as he walked, the black hopper that was nibbling at the wool of his sock, with its four-way lip, he realized that they had all turned black from living in a burned-over land. He realized that the fire must have come a year before. But the grasshoppers were all black now. He wondered how long they would stay that way. Carefully, he reached his hand down and took hold of the hopper by the wings. He turned him up, all his legs walking in the air, and looked at his jointed belly. Yes, it was black too, iridescent, where the back and head were dusty. Go on, Hopper, Nick said, speaking out loud for the first time. Fly away somewhere. He tossed the grasshopper up into the air and watched him sail away to a charcoal stump across the road. Nick stood up. He leaned his back against the weight of his pack where it rested upright on the stump and got his arms through the shoulder straps. He stood with the pack on his back on the brow of the hill looking out across the country toward the distant river and then struck down the hillside away from the road. Underfoot, the ground was good walking. Two hundred yards down the hillside, the fire line stopped. Then it was a sweet fern, growing ankle high to walk through and clumps of jack pines. A long, undulating country with frequent rises and descents. Sandy underfoot and the country alive again. Nick kept his direction by the sun. He knew where he wanted to strike the river, and he kept on through the pine pomp plain, mounting small rises to see other rises ahead of him. And sometimes, from the top of a rise, a great solid island of pines off to his right or his left. He broke off some sprigs of the heathery sweet fern and put them under his pack straps. The chafing crushed it and he smelled it as he walked. He was tired and very hot. Walking across the uneven, shadeless pine pond. At any time, he knew he could strike the river by turning off to his left. It could not be more than a mile away. But he kept on toward the north to hit the river as far upstream as he could go in one day's walking. For some time, as he walked, Nick had been in sight of one of the big islands of pines standing out above the rolling high ground he was crossing. He dipped down, and then, as he came slowly up to the crest of the ridge, he turned and made toward the pine trees. There was no underbrush on the island of pine trees. The trunks of the trees went straight up or slanted toward each other. The trunks were straight and brown, without branches. The branches were high above. Some interlocked to make a solid shadow on a brown forest floor. Around the grove of trees was a bare space. It was brown and soft underfoot as Nick walked on it. This was the overlapping of the pine needle floor extending out beyond the width of the high branches. The trees had grown tall and the branches moved high. Leaving in the sun this bare space they had once covered with shadow. Sharp at the edge of his extension of the for oh. Sharp at the edge of this extension of the forest floor commenced the sweet fern. Nick slipped off his pack and lay down in the shade. He lay on his back and looked up into the pine trees. His neck and back and the small of his back rested as he stretched. The earth felt good against his back. He looked up at the sky through the branches and then shut his eyes. He opened them again and looked up again. There was a wind high up in the branches 
He shut his eyes again and went to sleep. Nick woke, stiff and cramped. The sun was nearly down. His pack was heavy and the straps painful as he lifted it on. He leaned over with the pack on and picked up the leather rod case and started out from the pine trees across the sweet fern swale toward the river. He knew it could not be more than a mile. He came down a hillside covered with stumps into a meadow. At the edge of the meadow flowed the river. Nick was glad to get to the river. He walked upstream through the meadow. His trousers were soaked with the dew as he walked. After the hot day, the dew had come quickly and heavily. The river made no sound. It was too fast and smooth. At the edge of the meadow, before he mounted to a piece of high ground to make camp, Nick looked down the river at the trout rising. They were rising to insects come from the swamp on the other side of the stream when the sun went down. The trout jumped out of the water to take them. While Nick walked through the little stretch of meadow alongside the stream, Trout had jumped high out of the water. Now, as he looked down the river, the insects must be settling on the surface, for the trout were feeding steadily all down the stream. As far down the stream, long stretch as he could see, the trout were rising, making circles all around the surface of the water as though it were starting to rain. The ground rose, wooded and sandy, to overlook the meadow, the stretch of river and the swamp. Nick dropped his pack and rod case and looked for a level piece of ground. He was very hungry and wanted to make his camp before he could. Between two jack pines, the ground was quite level. He took the axe out of his pack and chopped out the projecting roots. That leveled a piece of ground, large enough to sleep on. And he smoothed out the sandy soil with his hands and pulled all the sweet fern bushes by their roots. His hands smelled good from the sweet fern, he then smoothed the uprooted earth. He did not want anything to make lumps under his blankets. When he had the ground smooth, he spread his three blankets. One he folded double next to the ground. The other two he spread on top. With the axe, he slid off a bright slab of pine from one of the stumps and split it into pegs for the tent. He wanted them long and solid to hold into the ground. With the tent unpacked and spread on the ground, the pack leaning against the jack pine looked much smaller. Nick tied the rope that served the tent for a ridge pole to the trunk of one of the pine trees and pulled the tent up off the ground with the other end of the rope and tied it to the other pine. The tent hung on a rope like a canvas blanket on a clothesline. Nick poked a pole he had cut up under the back peak of the canvas and then made it a tent by pegging out the sides. He pegged the sides out taunt and drove the pegs deep, hitting them down into the ground with the flat of the axe until the rope loops were buried and the canvas was drum tight. Across the open mouth of the tent, Nick fixed cheesecloth to keep out mosquitoes. He crawled inside under the mosquito bar with various things from the pack to put at the head of the bed under the slant of the canvas. Inside the tent, the light came through the brown canvas. It smelled pleasantly of canvas. Already, there was something mysterious and homelike. Nick was happy as he crawled inside his tent. He had not been unhappy all day. This was different, though. Now things were done. There had been this to do. Now it was done. It had been a hard trip. He was very tired. That was done. He had made his camp. He was settled. Nothing could touch him. 
it was a good place to camp. He was there in a good place. He was in his home where he had made it. Now he was hungry. He came out, crawling under the cheesecloth. It was quite dark outside. It was lighter in the tent. Nick went over to the pack and found with his fingers a long nail in a paper sack of nails in the bottom of the pack. He drove it into the pine tree, holding it close and hitting it gently with the flat of the axe. He hung the pack up on the nail. All his supplies were in that pack. They were off the ground and sheltered now. Nick was hungry. He did not believe he had ever been hungrier. He opened and emptied a can of pork and beans and a can of spaghetti into the frying pan. I've got a right to eat this kind of stuff if I've been willing to carry it, Nick said. His voice sounded strange in the darkening woods. He did not speak again. He started a fire with some chunks of pine he got with the axe from a stump. Over the fire, he stuck a wire grill, pushed the four legs down into the ground with his boot. Nick put the frying pan on the grill over the flames. He was hungrier. The beans and the spaghetti warmed. Nick stirred them and mixed them together. They began to bubble making little bubbles that rose with difficulty to the surface. There was a good smell. Nick got out a bottle of tomato ketchup and cut four slices of bread. The little bubbles were coming faster now. Nick sat down beside the fire and lifted the frying pan off. He poured about half the contents out into the tin plate. It spread slowly on the plate. Nick knew it was too hot. He poured on some tomato ketchup. He knew the beans and spaghetti were still too hot. He looked at the fire, then at the tent. He was not going to spoil it all by burning his tongue. For years, he had never enjoyed fried bananas because he had never been able to wait for them to cool. His tongue was very sensitive. He was very hungry. Across the river in the swamp, in the almost dark, he saw a mist rising. He looked at the tent once more, all right. He took a full spoonful from the plate. Christ, Nick said. Jesus Christ, he said happily. He ate the whole plateful before he remembered the bread. Nick finished the second plateful with the bread, mopping the plate shiny. He had not eaten since a cup of coffee and a ham sandwich in the station restaurant at St. Ing... Okay. St. Ignis. It had been a very fine experience. He had been that hungry before, but had not been able to satisfy it. He could have made camp hours before if he had wanted to. There were plenty of good places to camp along the river, but this was good. Nick tucked two big chips of pine under the grill. The fire flared up. He had forgotten to get water for the coffee. Out of the pack, he got a folding canvas bucket and walked down a hill across the edge of the meadow to the stream. The other bank was in the white mist. The grass was wet and cold as he knelt on the bank and dipped the canvas bucket into the stream. It bellied and pulled hard on in the current. Okay. It bellied and pulled hard in the current. The water was ice cold. Nick rinsed the bucket and carried it full up to the camp. Up away from the stream, it was not so cold. Nick drove another big nail and hung up the bucket full of water. He dipped the coffee pot half full put some more chips under the grill, onto the fire, and put the pot on. He could not remember which way he made coffee. 
He could remember an argument about it with Hopkins, but not which side he had taken. He decided to bring it to a boil. He remembered now that this was Hopkins' way. He had once argued about everything with Hopkins. While he waited for the coffee to boil, he opened a small can of apricots. He liked to open cans. He emptied the can of apricots out into a tin cup. While he watched the coffee on the fire, he drank the juice syrup of the apricots. Carefully at first to keep from spilling, then meditatively, sucking the apricots down. They were better than fresh apricots. The coffee boiled as he watched. The lid came up and coffee grounds ran down the side of the pot. Nick took it off the grill. It was a triumph for Hopkins. He put sugar in the empty apricot cup and poured some of the coffee out to cool. It was much too hot to pour, and he used his hat to hold the handle of the coffee pot. He would not let it steep in the pot at all. Not the first cup. It should be straight Hopkins all the way. Hop deserved that. He was a very serious coffee maker. He was the most serious man Nick had ever known. Not heavy serious. That was a long time ago. Hopkins spoke without moving his lips. He had played polo. He made millions of dollars in Texas. He had borrowed carefree to go to Chicago when the wire came that his first big well had come in. He could have wired for the money. That would have been too slow. They called Hop's girl the blonde Venus. Hop did not mind because she was not his real girl. Hopkins said very confidently that none of them would make fun of his real girl, and he was right. Hopkins went away when the telegram came. That was on the Black River. It took eight days for the telegram to reach him. Hopkins gave away his twenty two caliber Colt automatic pistol to Nick. He gave his camera to Bill. It was to remember him always by. They were all going fishing again next summer. The hophead was rich. He would get a yacht, and they would all cruise along the north shore of Lake Superior. He was excited, but serious. They said goodbye, all, and felt bad. It broke up the trip. They never saw Hopkins again. That was a long time ago on the Black River. Nick drank the coffee, the coffee according to Hopkins. It was bitter. Nick laughed. It made a good ending to the story. His mind was starting to work. He knew he could choke it because he was tired enough. He spilled the coffee out of the pot and shook the grounds loose into the fire. He lit a cigarette and went inside the tent. He took off his shoes and trousers Sitting on the blankets, rolled the shoes up inside the pants for a pillow and got in between the blankets. Out through the front of the tent, he watched the glow of the fire when the night wind blew on it. It was a quiet night. The swamp was perfectly quiet. Nick stretched under the blanket comfortably. A mosquito hummed close to his ear. Nick sat up and lit a match. The mosquito was on the canvas over his head. While Nick moved the match quickly up to it, the mosquito made a satisfactory hiss in the flame. The match went out. Nick lay down again under the blankets. He turned on his side and shut his eyes. He was sleepy. He felt sleep coming. He curled up under the blanket and finally went to sleep. All right. Thank you so much for watching. That was part one. See you next time.